Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to look at how to construct interpolating polynomials to a discrete set of data points. We'll introduce the idea of van der Mond matrices, and we'll also look at Lagrange polynomials and Lagrange interpolants. Okay, so let's begin now by looking at polynomial fitting. So let capital P of n be the set of all polynomials of degree n on the real numbers. So if we look at a particular nth degree polynomial, then it will be characterized by its coefficients, b0, b1, up to bn. And so we could write a particular member of this polynomial set as lowercase p, which is dependent on its parameters b, that we can write as a vector of length n plus 1. And so if we evaluate this polynomial at x with these coefficients b, then we'll get that that's equal to b0 plus b1 times x plus b2 times x squared all the way up to bn times x to the n. So suppose now that we're given n plus 1 data points as pairs of numbers x0, y0, x1, y1 up to xn, yn, and they form a set of values s. So let's now call the x values the interpolation points. So our goal here is to find a polynomial that passes through all of these n plus 1 values. So that means that for every different xi, we require that the polynomial evaluated at xi will give the corresponding value of yi. So that will give us n plus 1 equations. And so if we're looking for a solution to this problem, then we should choose polynomials that have n plus 1 unknowns. And that will actually equal to the polynomials of degree n. So let's now write out the system of equations that a polynomial must satisfy. We've got n plus 1 equations, and let's just focus on the first equation here. So the left-hand side of this equation is equal to our polynomial evaluated at x0, and the right-hand side is the corresponding data point y0. And we have the same thing all n plus 1 of our data points. So this set of equations here can be written now in matrix form. And so we end up with a matrix system vb equal y. And here, b is the set of polynomial coefficients, b0 up to bn. y is the set of data values, y0 up to yn. And v is the van der Mond matrix. And the van der Mond matrix is defined as shown here. In the first column, we'll have a column of ones. The second column will have a column of the x values to a single power. The third column will have the x values to the square power, and so on. So before we go ahead and solve the van der Mond system, let's ask whether a solution exists, and if so, if it will be unique. And it turns out that for any n plus 1 distinct interpolation points, the van der Mond system vb equal y will always have a unique solution. And to prove this, we'll make use of a result from linear algebra. So suppose we start with a square matrix, and suppose we have the following property, that a z equals 0 implies z equals 0. So if this property holds, then it tells us that this matrix A is non-singular. And if it's non-singular, then a matrix problem A B equal Y will have a unique solution. So now let's look at our van der Mond problem. So suppose that we have V B equals 0 then that tells us that our polynomial is 0 at n plus 1 distinct data points. But our polynomial is of degree n, and it can therefore have at most n roots. And so the only way that this can be consistent is if the polynomial itself is the 0 polynomial, and is 0 everywhere. And that tells us then that our coefficients b all have to be 0. So therefore we've established this property. vb equals 0 implies that b equals 0. And that tells us then that we have a unique solution to vb equal y. So this tells us that we can find the polynomial interpolant by solving the van der Mond system vb equal y. In general, however, this is not used in practice because the van der Mond matrix is typically ill-conditioned. And so the reason that the van der Mond matrix is ill-conditioned is because it corresponds to performing interpolation 
using the monomial basis, fitting the functions 1, x, x squared up to xn to our data points. And the problem here is that if we actually look at the monomial functions and we can rescale them, they actually become more and more indistinguishable when we go to higher powers of n. For example, if we plotted the functions x to the 14 and x to the 16 over the interval from minus 1 to 1, then they would actually look very similar. Similarly, odd powers such as x to the 7 or x to the 9 would also look very similar. And so using these functions as a basis for interpolation turns out to be not very effective. And to look at this in more detail, we're now going to look at calculating the condition number in Python for several van der Mond matrices. Okay, so let's just take a look at calculating the condition number for several van der Mond matrices. And we're going to make use of Python and the NumPy library. And we'll first look at a test case where we define a diagonal matrix with entries of a half and two and three on the diagonal. And if we now use the function np.linalge.cond to calculate the condition number of this matrix, then we find that this is equal to six. And that's exactly what we would expect. It's the ratio between the diagonal term of largest magnitude, three, and of smallest magnitude, 0.5. So that gives us six. So to calculate the van der Mond uh, condition number, we'll first need to assemble a van der Mond matrix. And the van der Mond matrix is dependent on the choice of interpolation or x points that we use. And we'll make use of the command np.linspace to first set up some, some interpolation points that are linearly spaced between 0 and 1. And from here, we can use the np.vanda command on this linearly spaced set of five points to construct a 5 by 5 van der Mond matrix. And we see that the rightmost column is made of all ones. And the next column is made of the x values. The next column is made of the x values squared, x values cubed, and x values to the fourth power. And we actually see here that the columns are in reverse order from how the van der Mond matrix was defined in the slides. And there are actually several different conventions people use for the van der Mond ordering of columns. And since this just corresponds to a reordering of the columns, it has no effect on the actual usage of this matrix in practice. The condition number is the same either way, and its usage for interpolation will be the same either way. So here, we can now calculate the condition number of this matrix. And this works out to be 686, which is already quite large. And so now let's look at what happens if we increase the number of points from 5 to 10. And we see that the condition number of this matrix rapidly grows. And so this is already at 15 million. So it's worth noting here that the choice of the interpolation points also affects the conditioning. And we actually find that if we move away from zero in our interpolation point, so we look at a range from, for example, one to two, still with 10 points, then we find that our condition number actually grows even further, up, up to, in this case, 267 billion. And so we see even for this quite small number of points of 10 points, we have very rapidly growing condition numbers. And you can see here that the scaling is rather poor, and if we went to more points, then this condition number would rapidly get very large indeed. So we've seen that van der Mond matrices are typically ill-conditioned, but we can now ask ourselves what are the practical consequences of this. So we begin by solving vb equal y, but due to finite precision arithmetic, we'll actually compute an approximation b hat. So if we use a stable numerical method, then we can ensure that the residual vb hat minus y is small. However, because v is ill-conditioned, we can still have that b minus b hat 
has a large norm. Similarly, a small perturbation in B hat can lead to a large perturbation in VB hat. And large perturbations in VB hat can correspondingly then lead to large residuals. And hence, a slightly perturbed interpolant can actually become a poor fit to the data. So these sensitivities are directly analogous to what happens if we use an ill-conditioned basis in an n-dimensional vector space. So as an example, let's consider a two-dimensional problem and let's suppose that we try and express vectors in terms of a basis made of v1, which is equal to 1, 0, and v2, which is equal to 1, 0, 0.0001. So now let's take two vectors that are very close together. We'll take a vector y, which is equal to 1, 0, and we'll take a vector y tilde, which is equal to 1, 0.0005. And we'll now express these vectors in terms of our basis, and we'll co call the corresponding expansion in that basis vectors b and b tilde. And so our vector y becomes the vector b, which is equal to 1, 0, and our vector y tilde becomes the vector b tilde, which is equal to minus 4, 5. And so we see here that even though the vectors y and y tilde are very close, their expansion in this new basis is actually quite far apart. And hence, our answer here is actually very sensitive to perturbations in our y vector. And so the same effect happens with interpolation using a monomial basis. So the answer that we find, the polynomial coefficient vector, is actually highly sensitive to perturbations in the data. And if we perturb b slightly, then we'll get a large perturbation in vb, and therefore no longer solve the van der Mond equation accurately. Hence, the resulting polynomial won't fit the data well. And we're now going to look at a few code examples that explore this in more detail. And we're actually going to look at two variations here of the same problem. So the first example I'm going to show you makes use of outputting results to a text file. And this can actually then be read by the freeware plotting program GNUplot, which is very flexible for reading in simple text files. The second approach I'm going to show you is using the native Python plotting library matplotlib. Let's now take a look at two code examples for doing polynomial interpolation using van der Mond matrices. And in this first example, vinter.py, we're going to use n equal 5 interpolation, or x points, and we're going to choose them to be equally spaced over the range from 0 to 3. We're going to choose corresponding function values to be sampled from the function e to the minus x, and we're now going to go ahead and solve the interpolation problem by creating a van der Mond matrix for our corresponding interpolation points with the numpy.vanda function. Now we can calculate our polynomial coefficients b by solving the linear system vb equal y using the numpy.linage.solve command. And now we want to plot our interpolant. And to do this, we're going to have to evaluate our polynomial at points throughout the interval from 0 to 3. And we're going to make use of a small computational technique here referred to as Horner's method. And suppose that we wanted to evaluate the cubic polynomial ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. Then the first thing that we might do is write this out explicitly as a times x times x times x plus b times x times x plus c times x plus d. But we can see here that as n increases, the degree of the polynomial increases, then we would actually spend a lot of time doing these successive powers of x. And in Horner's method, what we do is we notice that there are a number of common factors that we can group together here. And we can rewrite this expression in terms of a times x plus b, all multiplied by x times c, all multiplied by x times d. And for an nth degree polynomial, 
this only requires n additions and n multiplications. So it's very efficient and in particular scales well for polynomials high degree. So I've written out Horner's method in this section of code here. And this function here will then output our x positions, our polynomial interpolant, our reference function e to the minus x, and the difference between our interpolant and the reference function. And I'm just going to now run this program over here. And so by default, this program will output the results into the terminal window. And we're now going to make use of the standard terminal functionality where we can use the greater than symbol to redirect the output of our program to a temporary file that we'll call out. And to plot this, we'll now make use of the freeware plotting program GNUplot. And GNUplot is particularly well suited to plotting text files uh, with data in such as this. So I'm now going to switch over into a GNUplot window. So we'll now plot our results in GNUplot. And here I've launched GNUplot and I've set the X label to be X and the Y label to be Y. I'm now going to use the plot command to plot the file out that we just created using the first and second columns that gives us our polynomial interpolant with a line width of five. And I'm also going to plot the same file using the first and third columns that will give us our reference function e to the minus x with a smaller line width. And if we look at this plot, then we see that these two curves agree to very high accuracy. So if we wanted to zoom in on the small differences, then we can use the fourth column of our data file. And I'm also going to plot here a horizontal line at y equals zero for reference. And so we see now that the vertical scale here is much reduced and that this really emphasizes that the differences between the two curves are very small. And we see that there are some differences, but we also see that there are five points where the polynomial actually agrees exactly with our reference exponential. And that's exactly what we'd expect because we chose our polynomial to specifically interpolate the exponential at those points. So let's now look at the second example of vinter2.py. So this program does exactly the same task as the previous one, but uses Python's own matplotlib library to do the visualization internally. And so here we have the same pieces of code as before, although here we're going to actually use 12 interpolation points instead of five. We'll use the same setup and equally space them over the interval from zero to three and pick the corresponding function values from e to the minus x. So we'll solve the Vandermond problem again in the same way, and we'll now use NumPy arrays to create the data we need for plotting. So we'll create a range of x values, and we'll create the polynomial interpolant each of the x values. And to do that, we've written out a small function here that can calculate the polynomial using Horner's method. We'll also calculate our reference function, and we'll also evaluate the difference here. And after doing this, we'll then plot our figure using matplotlib. And we see here, again, that we get very good accuracy. It's hard to tell any difference between our interpolant and our reference exponential. So as mentioned, Vandermond interpolation is typically rather ill-conditioned. And to see the ill-conditioning, we can add in a small random perturbation into our polynomial coefficients of 10 to the minus 6 multiplied by a the function numpy.random.rand. And if we now run this function again, then we see that this small perturbation is enough to significantly affect the accuracy of the interpolant. And we see a noticeable difference in the interpolant and our reference function 
around the point of x equal 3. So we'd like to avoid these sensitivities when we perform interpolation. And so we can ask ourselves, how can we actually do better? And so we'd like to switch to a basis that is better conditioned. And in fact, we could even search for a basis where the interpolation problem actually becomes equivalent to solving by the identity matrix. And in fact, the identity matrix will be very well conditioned. It has condition number just equal to 1. And so that would really give us an ideal situation for interpolation. So to do this, we'll make use of Lagrange interpolation. And the key idea is to construct a basis of Lagrange polynomials, Lk, from 0 up to n, such that they satisfy the following properties, that if we evaluate Lk at some data point xi, then that will evaluate to 0 if i is not equal to k, and 1 if i is equal to k. And we can show that the polynomials are actually equal to Lk of x is equal to the product over all j not equal to k of x minus xj divided by xk minus xj. And once we have that, then for our given data points, we can just construct a polynomial interpolant by doing p n of x is just the sum from k equals 0 to n of yk times lk of x. So as an example, let's now look at two Lagrange polynomials of degree 5 using six interpolation points that are spread over the interval from minus 1 to 1. So we see here that they indeed satisfy this property. If we look at the blue curve here, then it is 1 at the third data point and 0 all the others. And if we look at the red curve, it is 1 at the final data point and 0 all the others. And so we've now solved this interpolation problem exactly. And if we actually revisit our example from the motivation section, then the polynomial that I showed you there could actually be constructed easily using these Lagrange polynomials.